Hello there, Sharks. I'm Jonathan Little for PokerNews.com. If you want all the poker news, make sure you check out PokerNews.com. And today, we're reviewing a hand from a 100, 200, 400 game that took place recently at Hustler Casino. They have a lot of amazing footage over at their YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Hustler, Hustler Casino Live. We'll put a link in the description below. Go there, check it out. And if there are any fun, exciting, maybe educational hands that you see there that you would like me to review here on my YouTube channel, they said I can review some hands here for y'all of you. So put a timestamp to the hand you want me to review in the comment section below, and I'll get right to it. This hand today features one of my favorite poker players in the world. Do you know who it is? It's Phil Ivey. He gets in there, he battles, he plays aggressive poker, and uh, it's always fun to watch him play. His opponent in this hand is going to be a guy named Gall Yefrock. Probably messing up his name. Um, sorry about that. $2 million in live tournament earnings, but that doesn't matter so much when we're playing a 100, 200, 400 cash game here at Hustler Casino. Let's take a look at this hand. Fold, 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 fold. Folds around oh, to I wish I had... Gall in the small blind, and he opts to limp. You may say, limp? What are we Call limping with here? <laughs> Ace Jack offsuit. You know what? I actually have a GTO chart for this spot. Let me pull it out. Here we go. This is what the small blind should limp with when folded to. All the hands in green should limp in this scenario. I know we're playing a three blind game, but big blind here is effectively small blind. As you see, very, very mixed strategies used in this spot. Now, I will say this chart is for 150 big blinds deep. They are playing even deeper than that. Okay? They're playing about 500 big blinds deep here. Okay. I would probably recommend mostly a raise or fold strategy in this scenario, just um, in general, because it's going to be way easier to implement. That said, you see this very wide limping strategy is quite strong, and um, that's, that's, that's a neat play you can make. Notice that ace-jack offsuit, assuming we're 150 big blinds deep again, not, not quite as deep. If, if we're shallower than we actually are, you see ace-jack offsuit actually limps a large chunk of the time. So pretty interesting spot where a lot of people think, oh, ace-jack, you should always raise, but um, take a look. Using good, strong GTO strategies, you're going to use very, very mixed strategies across the board, just so that you're not, um, you know, overly value-heavy when you raise and overly weak when you limp. Notice the raising range here contains a lot of the best hands and hands that generally flop well, hands with some blockers, and some uh, sporadic nonsense down here. So pretty cool strategy, right? These charts are available at PokerCoaching.com, by the way. I'm actually having a sale at PokerCoaching.com. It's not even a sale. It's just a five-day free pass. From November, November 15th to November 19th, you can get complete access to my training site, Poker Coaching Premium, for free. Cost you zero dollars. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash five days free. You'll have access to this chart, all the other charts, lots of content. Check it out. It's literally free. Costs you no money. All right. He lives fine. As soon as I fold it, I think, oh, I should have called. Well, looks Good like Ivy wants to get involved here. Yeah. Gall Great opens. Bet. And likewise, oh. the other one. <laughs> Thank you. I think you got your money back. All right. Gall limps. Phil Ivy raises to $1,600. Okay. What do you think a raising range in this spot looks like? Do you know? You should know if you play cash games, but I bet a lot of people are going to have no clue what a raising range looks like here because they're not used to playing good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. And you have to realize that if your opponent is good in the small blind, you better respond with a good strategy. And right here, seeing Gall just limp the ace jack is... You know, indicative that he's probably a pretty good player. So, what should Phil Ivy do? Turns out, this is it. All the hands in red raise. All the hands in green check. Notice that you're raising all the best hands, just straight up for value, right? All the best hands are raising. Lots of suited connected hands are raising. ASEC suit is raising. Some nonsense blocker bluffs are raising. And uh, then some sporadic, junky connected type hands. And take a look at this. 4-3 off suit, which, spoiler alert, Phil Ivy has, should raise some portion of the time. A lot of people look at this and think, why in the world would you raise the 4-3? Because you're raising with all these good value hands. You want to get money in the pot with all of your good value hands. And um, if you're raising with a lot of good value hands, you also get to have some bluffs. And it um, turns out the 4-3 is actually an okay hand to bluff with. 16? Yeah. A lot of people in live cash games make the error, the blunder, of trying to look at their opponent, make a read, and then they just go with it for the whole hand. They're like, hmm, what do you have preflop? You don't have anything. I'm calling you down. Doesn't work like that. Looks like, oh, it's just it's blind versus blind. Yeah. So Gall yeah. lipped in here with ace jack and Phil is raised with a mystery hand here. 4-3 offsuit. Yeah. Little spoiler for blind versus last blind. All right. Gall checks on king, 
Queen, Jack, two hearts. Gaul has the Ace of Hearts. Definitely a fine spot to check and call if you've studied my Cash Game Masterclass at PokerCoaching.com. Again, get access to that. PokerCoaching.com slash five days free. You would know that this hand, bottom pair, ace kicker, straight draw, flush draw, well, backdoor flush draw, this is a hand that is very, very happy to just check and call down for the most part. There may be some runouts where you end up folding, like say a, a nine comes perhaps, that would be especially terrible. But really, assuming Gall is playing well, and he knows Phil Ivey is capable of raising with more than just the nuts, I mean, take a look at all these hands down here that are pretty garbage. This is a spot where you're just doing everything you can to get to the showdown. Phil Ivey bets so 2,300 with the zip and pip 4-3 offsuit. I don't mind it. Uh, this is a scenario where when you do limp, I'm sorry, when Gaul limps, Phil has to ask, what does Gaul's limping range look like? And if it looks like a lot of medium and high cards, maybe you're just supposed to just give up immediately. Feels a little bit weak to me to raise the 4-3 and then just give up in a spot where your opponent could easily have stuff like low and medium pairs, 9 high, maybe ace high that folds to additional bluffs, etc. But you should be giving up some portion of the time. This is where it's really important to understand what your range looks like. Because if Ivy's range is this, and notice he actually does have a whole lot of good strong hands, right? And all these hands don't mind putting money in the pot. He does also have a whole lot of these junky hands, though, if he's playing good, strong GTO poker. So you have to be a little bit careful over continuation betting in the spot, I think. Here. I don't think Gaul's going anywhere here again, though, with these jack with the ace of hearts, as played. And you couldn't get him out of the panic gunpoint, buddy. Sure. There's the cards. Wow, Phil taking one from Mickey here. 3-4 yeah. off. Yeah, man, can't win with jacks. Might as well go for it with 4-3 off. And he's going to... Turns it. Two. Stone brick. Should Phil Ivy go for it again? Look, I can already tell you, if Phil Ivey is going to bet this turn, he may be locked into bluffing the river. Because whenever you bet turn, anyone with any hand containing a 10 is going to call. Any flush draw, which you are losing to, is going to call. And a lot of those hands will call turn and then fold river. Like if you give your opponent a hand like queen 10, maybe even queen 9, stuff like that, those are always going to call the turn and perhaps fold the river. So this is a spot where either Phil probably just should give up but if he gets the vibe that his opponent's especially weak, or maybe he decided, I'm just going to be hyper-aggressive on this hand, then I don't mind going for it. Pot 7,600. Play it like you have the nuts. Fire the second barrel. That is not going to get, 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 get rid of Gaul unless Wait, no, really Gaul sees something that's not there. So Gaul now with his third pair ace kicker is actually in a pretty tough spot because he picked up no additional equity whatsoever. But he's playing against an opponent who is good, strong, aggressive, and battling. This is a scenario where a lot of people chicken out and fold. And that would be a gigantic blunder. You cannot fold this hand at this point. It's not a great hand, but it is definitely a solid bluff catcher. The nice thing about the ace-jack as well is that it blocks some of Ivy's value hands, right? It blocks ace-king, it blocks pocket aces, it maybe blocks ace-queen if he has it. Also blocks king-jack, queen-jack, pocket-jacks. So the fact that he has this ace and jack is is pretty reasonable. Now, he'd rather not have the ace of hearts here. Like, he would rather Phil Ivey have a lot of ace, x of hearts in his range. When you have the ace of hearts, it's, it's not a particularly great bluff-catching card in particular. But it, the, the fact that, um you know, it does block ace-king and aces and he blocks the jacks, this is a hand you're just never, ever folding here. You'd rather have a hand like um, ace of spades jack, though, because with ace of spades jack, then you don't block the ace high flush draws, which are a lot of Ivy's obvious bluffs. Remember, Gaul's hand is very under okay. here. He limped into the middle blind. Yeah. And Ivy raised, and he's going to check call twice now. Will Ivy fire a third barrel on a brick? Well, that's, that's not so a sick. brick. River's an ace. River is the ace of clubs. Flush draw does not come in. Phil Ivy has the four high, the literal nut low. Yikes. All the tens make a straight. Lots of the pairs make two pair. What a tough spot. What would you do in Phil Ivey's shoes? If you could channel the great Phil Ivey and figure out what he's going to do. What would he do? What would you do? Take a second. Pause video and write in the comment section below if you would check and give it up. If you'd bet small, like 6,000. If you'd bet big, like 18,000. Or if you'd bet gigantic, like 40,000 into this 20,000 pot. Pause the video and write what you would do in the comment section below.
All right, first things first. What are we trying to get to fold? Definitely something you should always consider here. And also, which hands am I betting for value? Would you be going for value here with a hand like ace-king or even pocket jacks? I think the answer is probably just no because it's very, very easy for Gaul to have a 10, especially if he's a good player, he's going to check the 10 out of position. So what are we trying to get to fold here? We're trying to get a one-pair hand to fold, like king-9, queen-9, jack-9, or maybe a bad two-pair, like, um, well, ace-jack. Maybe maybe a hand like queen-jack, right? Maybe a hand like um, ace-two suited, right? So... The question is, how much do we need to bet to get those one pair and two pair hands to fold? We're not really trying to get a straight to fold because that's ridiculous. So in this scenario, I don't think we want to go small. I think small would be especially bad because two pairs always going to call a small bet and maybe even one pair decides to hero call a small bet. So I think small like 6,000 would be particularly bad. So then it just becomes a question of should we bet pretty big or gigantic? And um, I think either size has merit. Really, the question is, how many 10s does Phil Ivey has in his range? Um, as he has more and more value hands, he gets to have more and more bluffs. I have to presume, though, that Ivey probably doesn't have a ton of 10s here. Because if you think about it, if he had a hand like Queen 10 or Jack 10 on the turn, he's going to check it back a decent chunk of the time. So really, we're only looking at Ace 10, which is the nuts, right? Which is also blocked by the Ace on the board. King 10, which... You know, could have bet the turn. I think that's reasonable. 10-9, which makes sense. And then stuff like 10-8, 10-7, 10-6, which he may or may not raise before the flop. If we look over here at uh, the pre-flop raising range, though, we do see it does contain some 10s, assuming Ivy's playing good, strong GTO poker, right? So there are various 10s that he could have in his range. So it's, it's tough to actually know what his range does look like here. I think, though, I would probably just go for a big size, like pot. Because whenever you bet pot, I think you're going to start to get all the one pair hands to fold. And I do think most two pairs will find folds, unless they think you're just hyper aggressive. And to be fair, maybe they think that of Phil Ivey. It's a tough thing to know. Um, if you think, though, that your opponent's always going to call with two pair, if you pot it, then that size probably doesn't become all that great. Because I do think you are going to be against a lot of ace-queen and ace-jack in this scenario. That said, maybe... Gaul doesn't actually have a ton of those in his range, even though we do see the ace-jack here. So if we think he doesn't have ace-queen or ace-jack or ace-king, then we're trying to get him off of, like, king-queen, which maybe raises the flop, king-jack, which maybe raises the flop, or queen-jack, which maybe raises the flop. So if that's the case, he probably doesn't have all that many two-pair, right? Because a lot of them would raise the flop or raise pre-flop. So that means that we're mainly looking at a hand like a one-pair hand, like ace of hearts, x of hearts, maybe a king, maybe a queen, maybe a jack. So if that's the case, I don't think we want to go gigantic here because you don't need to go gigantic to get one pair to fold. And I do think we're going to be against one pair a large chunk of the time here. So I think a bet of something like pot would be quite nice. That um, will probably result in you getting called by two pair some chunk of the time. But I think that's, in general, a relatively small portion of Gaul's range. I think Gaul's going to have a lot of straights here, which you want to bet whatever the minimum is against those because you lose, obviously, and they're never folding. Or one pair hand. And I think something like a little bit less than pot will probably get the one pair type hands to fold. And if he has two pair, you know, maybe he even finds a hero fold if he has a weaker one. You come to that same conclusion? Interesting spot, right? Let's see how it fell. I can come up with it. Yeah. Gall makes aces up. Phil's going to lose some more money here. By the way, by the way, should should he even bluff? Does he have to bluff? I think given that Gall's, Gall's range here is going to be a lot of one pair hands, like I said, I, I think you just have to bluff here. Seems pretty mandatory. Especially if you're going to be betting a lot of 10s on the turn, which I definitely think you should, if you do have them. Just the way it is. Pot's 19.6. Ivy goes. And he's going to bet 17,000. About pot. Gold, nice. He's going to tank. Well, the question I have is, is that he's definitely representing like he has a 10, and what 10 takes this line for these streets? Could it be King 10? I don't think 10's bets twice here, Nick. Maybe ace 10, but it's... So, um, great commentator. Bart Hansen here says he doesn't think he's betting twice with 10's. I would probably disagree. I mean, think about it, right? It, if Ivy is playing roughly the GTO strategy, which maybe it, maybe is, maybe isn't. But like 10-9 suited is obviously betting because that's a straight. 10-8 suited. If you have 10-8 suited on this board, you bet the flop and get called. I mean, that seems like a really good bluffing hand here to me. If you bet, he, you're not going to get raised very often at all. And if you spike a 9, that's really good. And if you spike an ace, that's really good, right? So I think 10-8's certainly a reasonable hand to keep bluffing here. Same thing with like 10-7 offsuit, 10-6 offsuit, 
10 2 offsuit made a pair. It's probably okay to bluff too, because the pair is like never good. Right? 10 4 suited, sure. So like there, there aren't a ton of tens in his range. I, I definitely agree with that. They want to bet, because like I said, Queen 10 and Jack 10 probably don't bet the turn too often. But he's got a lot of ace 10, which are the nuts. He's got 10 9 suited, all of those, 10, a lot of 10 7 offsuit. So I, I think that the tens would probably keep betting the turn because he also has a lot of good value hands, right? He has all the nuts. Literally all the nuts in his range. When you have all the nuts in your range, you need to find bluffs. And I think hands containing an ace are probably okay to bluff, even though they may have a little bit of showdown value, probably not a lot on the turn. And I think the tens are pretty pretty clear bluffs. The nine and lower are probably not great bluffs because if you river a ten and make the bottom end of the straight, it's not particularly great. So I gotta presume Ivy's gonna be pretty polarized on the turn betting with mostly um, tens and flush draws for, for bluffs and maybe some ace high. I think that's pretty reasonable. So, do you find the call with the ace jack? I do. It's annoying. Just a solid bluff catcher, right? We, we started the hand. I told you right off the bat. Pretty much no matter how this hand plays out, unless it runs off really badly, we're going to check call flop, check call turn, check call river. We have a clear bluff catcher. Sometimes I was going to show you the nuts. Sometimes I'm going to show you the bluff. But when you have a clear bluff catcher, you just have to find a call. Ball has the ace of hearts. He's going to put a time extension in here. I would be... So shocked if Gal let this go. I don't see it happening. He's gonna take his time. Sometimes you just can't fold. Nine nine nine. You think he's gonna fold? So Ivy with the triple barrel with pure air. Is it really gonna work? Classic Phil Ivy. Four high, bluff it off. Great success. Gall Rivers aces up. Very underrepped here too. He's gonna call. Oh, he yeah. makes the call. Yeah. You got it. Hmm. All right, that's me for today. I would have bluffed it off just like Phil Ivy there and I would have lost a bunch of money. Good thing I wasn't in his scene in that exact scenario. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click the like and subscribe button below. And also, if you like poker strategy, if you like learning about the game, studying the game extensively, make sure you check out my free five-day pass to poker coaching premium right now at pokercoaching.com slash five days free. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great day. Thank you for being here. Thanks to Hustler Casino Live for letting us use the footage. And we'll talk to you next time. Howdy, partners. Station Master Little here with a public service announcement. It's come to my attention that a few of you have become extreme calling stations. Now, I love calling. I'm the Station Master, after all. But you can't call a queen high every time. Sometimes you have to fold. Click subscribe to make sure you don't become a super station.